my fabulous social media friends, Rob Wells here again from Dabs Domestic Abuse Business Support Limited. Today, I want to introduce you to a documentary. It was produced by the fabulous Chloe Rose, who is a student journalist at the Centre for Journalism. She's also an interim at KMTV Kent and a reporter at The Voice of Kent. The documentary is called Unmasking Abusers, Protecting the Legacy of Claire Wood. It's an investigation of how well Claire's law works in offering better protection to victims of domestic abuse. I want to say a huge thank you to Chloe for the opportunity to appear in the documentary and I know that your cousin Charlotte would be incredibly proud of you. With that, here's the documentary. The death of Claire Wood should have been a watershed moment for domestic abuse victims. Since 2014, Home Office guidelines drawn up in her memory have made it harder for abusers to hide a history of violence, as police can now disclose their criminal records. However, latest government figures have shown domestic abuse homicides are at a five-year high, raising the question as to whether or not Claire's law is failing. So I was uh, curious, was it working? It was him telling me repeatedly um, how he was going to kill me. I never looked myself in the mirror and went, you're the victim of domestic abuse. 30, 30 days is the difference between someone living or dying. I wouldn't have thought Claire's law was for me as a man. My fear is not only for myself, but for other women. For other women that um, he may get into a relationship with. Claire Wood was just 36 when she was strangled and set on fire by her ex-partner George Appleton at her home in Salford in Manchester in 2009. Her family later learned that Appleton had a hidden history of violence against women. In 2014, Claire's father, Michael Brown, won a campaign to give better protection to those at risk of domestic abuse. But Claire's law isn't an actual law, instead it's a set of guidelines. Anyone can make a right to ask application to the police to find out if their partner has any previous convictions that poses them a threat. Police can also exercise a right to know where they can disclose information to anyone they think could be at risk without that person needing to make an application themselves. In 2019, there were a total of 6,583 criminal record disclosures made, yet the number of domestic abuse victims keeps rising. Having lost someone myself to domestic abuse, I wanted to find out why Claire's law isn't helping more people escape this violent crime. I started talking to Jane, a woman who recently left an emotionally and financially abusive relationship. She asked me to use a fake name to protect her identity. After contacting the police to report her abuse, she was advised by a friend to make a right to ask application. Jane hadn't heard of the scheme before and wasn't sure how it worked. I asked about Claire's Law and they said, oh, you want to apply f for Claire's Law? And I went, yes, because I want to know if he's got any previous. And they said, well, yeah, we can do that. We can do that, but it'll take about 30 days and you'll get an email. I think it was an email. I never heard back either way, so I still to this day don't know if they did it or not. I almost got the sense that they didn't really know much about it. 30, 30 days is the difference between someone living or dying. You know, it, it's a great concept and a great idea, but if you've got understaffed services, then how can you put that into practice? In one of the most tragic cases, 30 days was the difference between life and death. Rosie Derbyshire was waiting for a response from her right to ask application when she was murdered by her partner. In some cases, it can take up to 35 days to get a response once an application has been made. Rosie was killed just 11 days after she made hers. Her death raised questions about how Claire's law works in practice, as there have been calls to lower the waiting time for a response. Former Labour MP Graham Jones put forward a question to Home Secretary Priti Patel for there to be a review of Claire's law. Rosie Derbyshire um, had requested to information. Um, there was a obviously a 30 day window for the police and she was murdered after 11 days. Um, and I think that that's avoidable. I think that 
the issue is whether the uh, this issue was put to the bottom of the police pile, um, or and and therefore um, it had tragic consequences, or or were the police genuinely trying to uh, expedite the information as quickly as possible, uh, but were frustrated. You know, I think we need to understand why we ended up in a situation where she was murdered, despite um, you know wishing to to try and. Um, find out information on a new partner. I asked Mr Jones if police forces have the funding they need to respond to applications within the current 35 day period. Police resources have been cut. There is uh, a scarcity within the police um, and you have to ask the question, um, does that scarcity, do those cuts to police budgets um, result in uh, you know, issues not being dealt with as quickly as they should have been dealt with. In 2019, almost 6,500 right to ask applications were made, with only 40% of those resulting in a successful disclosure. Disclosure rates vary across the UK, given the appearance of a postcode lottery. In Hampshire, more than 9 in 10 people received a successful disclosure. Where I am in Kent, 158 applications were made last year, but there were only 14 disclosures. That's less than 1 in 10 people receiving potentially life-saving information. I contacted Kent Police to find out how they process applications and why their disclosure rate was so low, but they declined to comment. So to find out more about how the scheme works, I spoke to Dr Marion Duggan from the University of Kent, who has spent the last five years carrying out research on Clare's Law. So I was uh, curious, was it working? Initially I suppose it was something that was seen to be quite useful, it allows people the opportunity to access information, but it wasn't really thought through in, in the ways that now I think are being recognised that it's not fulfilling its potential. It's domestic violence and we know from decades of research and anecdotal uh, stories from friends and family the majority of domestic violence doesn't end up in the police knowledge. People minimise it, they um, try and downplay the seriousness, they might not articulate it in a way that indicates the severity to the police officer. Now if the police don't have that sort of baseline information they can't make that assessment about how serious is your risk and is it serious enough for us to breach the privacy of the person whose information you're requesting. This was an initial concern that it, the, the framework of the policy didn't match the nature of the relationship between the people that were seeking the information. This isn't a prevention policy, it's a, a prevention of escalation or a prevention of continuation. It only works if there's been domestic violence and if that victim has reported it. We need to start noting abuse or violence or any sort of criminal activity as having a domestic element on police national computers in order for uh, later on down the line a police officer looking for that history to see oh right it wasn't just assault and um, with no other information about who it was it was assault against a partner. For Claire's law to be able to provide protection someone has to have already suffered abuse and reported it. According to Home Office figures, only 23.6% of victims considered what happened to them to be a crime, and only 34.3% of victims considered what they were experiencing to be domestic abuse. Naomi Donald suffered in silence for 10 years before finding her voice and reporting her abuse to the police. Her ex-partner was convicted of three counts of rape, two counts of false imprisonment, assault occasioning in actual bodily harm and possession of a firearm with intent. He was sentenced to a minimum of 14 years in prison. Naomi spoke to me about why it was so hard to report her abuse. The emotional and mental abuse escalated to um, physical and sexual um, abuse. Um, so it just got really, really, um, it was a real, real scary and horrible time. Um, I'd been beaten up really badly. Um, he raped me and sexually assaulted me right before I was meant to be having a party for my daughter and I just thought, I can't do this anymore. It was him telling me repeatedly um, how he was going to kill me. And I just felt this wave of fear go from my feet. Like, it just went right up my body. And in my head, I just thought, I know 
I can't, I can't stay with this person. I picked up the phone, I phoned the police, and even then, I didn't want to tell them what had happened. And this is a mad thing about when somebody has that power and control over you because um, I had been arrested, taken away and whatever, and then um, I'd kind of gone back to my house, I was staying between my mum's and my house. He was still writing me letters from prison. I was still going to see him, like, you know, and he was, like, kind of, you know, encouraging me, like, not to go through with it and everything. I just kept saying to myself, I don't know what to do because um, if I go to court, and he does get a long sentence and everybody's going to come after me, do you know what I mean? But then, if I don't go to court and he gets out, then he's going to kill me anyway because, like, I've, I've blew this all up, so... Naomi's ex-partner is to be released from prison any day now after serving 17 years. Naomi has concerns for any other women that could get into a relationship with him. But that's what the right to know was designed for, to allow police to warn new partners of the danger they could find themselves in. When making a disclosure, police must decide how serious the applicant's risk is and if it is serious enough to breach the privacy of the person whose information is being requested. Otherwise, criminal records are protected by Article 8 of the Human Rights Act, the right to privacy. But how can we expect police to know if offenders start new relationships? How are they going to inform the partner if they don't know that he's with the partner? So uh, my understanding is whilst he's been in prison, he's had several partners. Um, and I'm not sure if they've ever been contacted by any, you know, police or professionals to say, do you know what you're dealing with? This is a dangerous individual. My fear is not only for myself, but for other women, for other women that um, he may get into a relationship with, because if we know that this is a person um, that has three separate cases of rape against him, that's the three that we know about. How many more victims and women around, out there walking around, knowing that they've been raped by this individual, but they haven't said anything to anybody? I know all too well the effects that domestic abuse can have on a family. My cousin Charlotte had her life taken by her ex-boyfriend last year. I'm here at her memorial bench, where friends and family come to pay tribute and remember her. Charlotte was vibrant and outgoing, and her passing has left a huge void in the lives of those who loved her. To my family's knowledge, she had never made a Claire's Law application. She had known her ex-partner for a long time and thought that she could trust him. He was convicted and sentenced to a minimum of 20 years for her murder. But even now, knowing that he has at least 19 years left behind bars, I already worry for anyone that he could get into a relationship with in the future. I wanted to find out how the police would inform future partners of his of the danger that he could pose them. So in your cousin's case, the perpetrator, there'll be like a probation period that if they come out, they come out on license. There'll be certain stipulations around that and one might be to inform their probation officer if they get into a new relationship. I feel really concerned knowing that the police rely on offenders to report new relationships in order for the right to know to work effectively. I started talking to Abby, who has received a right to know disclosure. She asked me to use a fake name to protect her identity. Abby told me how Claire's law may have saved her life. They traced me through my son's school as I'm not known to the police. They arranged through the school to meet me in the headmistress's office. Obviously I had no clue and thought it was a meeting for my son. Then a lady who worked for MASH asked me if I was aware of Claire's law. She asked if I was in a relationship with said person and then asked me to sign a disclosure. She said that they had made a decision based on risk in his history that I needed to be informed. I never found out who asked for the disclosure to be made, but I'm forever grateful to that person. Claire's law could have saved my life, I guess. On April 28th, the Domestic Abuse Bill was finally considered in the Commons for its second reading, having been delayed due to Brexit and the general election. The bill proposes to give domestic abuse a statutory definition for the very first time. Having a legal definition of domestic abuse will also give legal basis to Claire's law. This is essential in making sure that the scheme's guidelines are used and applied consistently across all police forces. I think domestic uh, violence is, and abuse is, um, is, a, is a terrible blight on society, particularly for women. And, um, and I think that Claire's law um, is, a, is a really important law. Um, and I think we need to go further to protect the victims of domestic abuse and domestic violence. 
domestic violence bill is a perfect vehicle for, for change. Um, uh, and, and, and of course, this would fall within the scope of that bill. The ultimate end is to legally to shorten the um, deadline in which the police can respond. It's often thought that Claire's law can only be used by women. However, this isn't the case. Another benefit of the domestic abuse bill is that it aims to ensure men know that Claire's law is there to help them too. Home Office figures showed that last year 786,000 men were victims of domestic abuse. Robert Wells lived through several years of emotional, financial and physical abuse. He left his partner before Claire's law was introduced, so has never made an application himself. However, as an advocate for male victims, I wanted to speak to him about why men may feel reluctant to use Claire's law. I never looked myself in the mirror and went, you're the victim of domestic abuse. I wouldn't have thought Claire's law was for me as a man because it was launched on, it's called Claire's Law. It was launched on International Women's Day and every single time, if you, if you look back now at the, the press releases and everything else, all it talks about is protecting women and girls. I think it is an invaluable tool for both men and women, but I think we need to really change the way we talk about domestic abuse and we talk about it as a perpetrator and victim crime not a gender crime. I think there's a lot of guys out there that would use it if they knew it was there to help them as well. While Claire's law may have been designed to be an invaluable tool, some failings of the scheme, most notably the death of Rosie Derbyshire, have shown that it isn't working as well as it should be. While the domestic abuse bill holds the key to change for Claire's law, the media also has a significant role to play in promoting awareness of the scheme. Coronation Street is the first soap to include Claire's Law in a domestic abuse storyline. Scenes aired earlier this year showed one of the soap's characters, Yasmin, calling the police to access information on her partner's past, after her granddaughter raised concerns over his behaviour. Oh, hello. I'd like to speak to someone about accessing information under Claire's law, please. Yasmin later received a disclosure about her partner. The landlady of the pub phoned the police, claiming that your husband and Miss Walkie were involved in a domestic incident. We could take you to a women's refuge service if you'd prefer. I'm not some sort of battered wife. It's not always about physical violence, Yasmin. The soap has been praised by viewers for shining light on Claire's law, with many saying they had never heard of it before. I'm hopeful that if the proposed domestic abuse bill passes through the Commons, it will see more awareness raised for this life-saving scheme. I asked Dr Duggan what her research over the last five years has shown her so far about Claire's law, and if it has the potential to become more useful in the future. It's a starting point, and I think what's been uh, I suppose what's been positive for me, or reassuring, is there's been different guidance that comes out and there's also been evolution of this policy. They are listening, so they are looking at how is it working, they're listening from experts, they are changing in line with recommendations, and that's good. <laughs> so that's, you know, if they are amenable to suggestions, then we can think about, right, how might something like this um, be useful? As MPs return to work, the domestic abuse bill has become even more of a priority on their agenda. While the world went into lockdown, one of the most pressing concerns for the UK alongside the coronavirus pandemic is the sharp spike in the number of domestic abuse incidences. It's never been a more important time for MPs to get this right, as lockdown highlights just how many people do not have a safe home. There is still a disparity in the UK as to where you're most likely to receive a successful disclosure. People need to know that no matter where they are in the country, they will still receive the same level of care from the police. Throughout my investigation, a number of concerns regarding Claire's law were raised. From my conversation with Jane, it became clear that when looking to move forward and improve Claire's law, response time to applicants must be within the 35-day period, or sooner if possible. Robert wants men to know that Claire's law is there to help them as well as women. And Naomi wants victims of domestic abuse to get the reassurance that the right to know is working effectively in stopping anyone else falling victim to their abuser. 
The Domestic Abuse Bill offers Clare's Law the legal basis that it needs to tackle these issues. I'm hopeful that by giving this legal basis, Clare's Law will fulfil its potential and Clare's legacy can be what her family wanted it to be.